Before Joel's scripture, or before Joel's sermon, the scripture is 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? There was a commercial a few years ago for one of the Coca-Cola products. <clears throat> I don't remember which one. It was one of the... Apparently this will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise because the premise of the commercials went something like this. It'd be a man interviewing for a job, and he's uber confident, I assume because he drank caffeine-free Coke or whatever it was, and he was uber confident, and a guy offers him a job. He says, you got the job, half a million dollars a year. And he would say, and? And he'd say, two extra weeks of vacation. And he'd say, and? Full access to my catamaran. And the point was, if you drank this soda, you could just demand all you wanted to, and you get all these benefits. It doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. You may not be able to buy a soda once you get through making all those demands. But that was the premise of it, was to get that. And that's uh, it's indicative of our society, but it's probably been indicative of every society that's ever been. Me, 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 more, 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 right? What else can I get out of this? What else can help me? What else can I get? What kind of fringe benefits or anything else? But listen, folks, God has a plan with benefits. And part of the benefits, and we know about the benefits as far as heaven. But in particular, what I want to look at today is our benefit plan that we are having now and the way God has set it up that we can benefit from being a child of God and from worshiping, from doing all the things that we, we do, and how, how God has set that up for us. And I want to look at this first of all, because I think this is overlooked sometimes. One of the benefits in the plan that God has for us, He's given us, is fellowship. And folks, this is a huge benefit for Christian people. To be able to come together as they did when the church first began there in Acts chapter 2. They, would, they, could, <clears throat> excuse me, they were to come together and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. In verse 46, they were doing the same thing there. It says in the temple they were steadfast. And there they were breaking bread from house to house. They were with each other a lot. And just as we do, there's always food. And amen. But these things would come together and they would go together and it was a strengthening. Please notice here in Acts chapter 2, the church just began. And they knew something sometimes that churches in our world don't never, never do understand is that you need to come together more than once a week for a couple of hours. It's good to see each other. Sometimes just a few, sometimes as many as you can get, whatever it is, but it's always good to do that. The fellowship, the time together, the time we spend together. We are, when we're together, we are out of the world for just a little bit, a little while. We are out of the world for an hour, a couple of hours, or whatever it is. We are out of the world, so to speak. We're with one another. We're not worrying about language. We're not worried about uh, filthy jokes. We're not worried about other things that people do. We're not worried about all the things that flow and go crazy in this world we have to live with all the time. We can come together and be free of that atmosphere. We can, as they did, continue steadfastly, always doing that and looking for the opportunities to get away from the world, folks. And as Christians, that's something we should do every chance we get to make sure we can get away from the world, to make sure we can be with one another, that we can get those benefits. You notice I, I chose this. I ran, ran across it by accident, but it was really great. Benefits over here says advantages or rewards obtained from doing certain actions or from a proposal. Now, that's in the business world, but we're looking at the spiritual world this morning. And notice what we get from being together, coming together for a certain event or whatever it is. We get great benefit from that, that God has set it up. He has set it up where we can be together and understand that people are in our circumstances or in our shoes. 
that we can come together and learn from one another. We can come together and pray for one another. We can cry with one another. We can do all of these things, but if we never fellowship, folks, we're missing out on a benefit that God has given. We didn't ask and, that long and, like that guy said in the commercial, and... You don't have to ask that with God. He's already given us things that we don't even use half the time. But understanding about fellowship, understanding what it does. John said there in 1 John 1 and verse 3, talking about the fellowship there, the things that he has heard and they have seen, he says, here's the idea, he says, is fellowship with Jesus, with one another, he says, and our fellowship is with the Father and with Jesus Christ. We are together whether we like it or not. We are one body whether you like it or not. And folks, those are advantages that God has set up. When we look at the New Testament idea of unity, of oneness, look at the idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and he mentions all those parts of the body, but all of them come together for one purpose, under one head. And folks, look, that's the way that God set it up. I see people all the time, and you do too, that like to change up God's plans, God's ways, God's desires, God's doctrines, God everything else, and somehow think they've got it better. We can't do any better than what God has already set up. He wants us to fellowship. He wants us to see one another. He wants us to be around one another. Uh, I still love Galatians Galatians chapter 6, the description there, with those of like precious faith. Now notice how we are described in that passage. Like the same, precious, it's just, we don't use that word all the time, but the Bible uses it too, precious faith. It's that faith that God has given us, that faith in which we live, and we can come together and explore that. I know, I've worked in the secular world before, and I know what we get from a secular world. We don't get the fellowship that we get here. Oh, you can get fellowship all right. You can get fellowship that will lead you down the wrong path and in a moment's time. You can get people that don't care anything about the kind of language they use or the kind of jokes that they tell or the kind of behavior that they do or the things they approve of. Some don't care about anything. Just leave me alone let me do my thing. And they'll put it in your face every day. Don't you like to escape that, church? Please don't... If, if you don't mind being in those situations and it doesn't bother you, I encourage you to read Psalm 1. Just the first three verses, half the psalm. You don't have to read it all yet. Read those first three verses. You understand about a situation where when we walk, sit, and stand with evil, with bad things, we become so comfortable that we don't want to get out of it. I like to get away from the world. I don't like to be in it all the time. But we can't run from it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, we're going to get away from the world completely. We'd have to be out of the world. And if we were astronauts, we'd be with people who weren't Christians, wouldn't we? It'd still be difficult, would it not? But fellowship, folks, is a great benefit that God has given us uh, since the beginning until now as well. <clears throat> encouragement. I mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again, about the encouragement that we can get from one another. Some of it's through that fellowship we just looked at. Some of it is through that, the time we can spend together here. But one thing, the benefit plan we have encouragement is it's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, if we need it. We can find encouragement from each other. I've always liked this, the, the passage here in Hebrews 10 and verse 24, and we, we go through these passages and talk about assembling and that sort of thing, which is important, obviously. But I want to notice why they need to come together as the church that they may encourage, quite literally, or to stir up, he says in the New King James, stir up one another, in order to stir up one another for love and good works. That's one of the reasons, one of the reasons that we come together as the church, that I can reach out and stir you. Hey, I've been a preacher for 20 years. I've stirred a lot of people, sometimes for the better, believe it or not. (laughs) <laughs> sometimes for the worse. But you know what? People have stirred me too. And for the good, I mean. They've stirred, we, can, we can provoke, we can stir, we can encourage one another in all these different ways and get us through this life that you can have with not. And that's why he goes on to say in verse 25 that we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner. Someone made it a habit never to come to the assembly of the church. 
Folks, when we do that, we're missing out. I need encouragement. You need encouragement. Whether we know it or not, we all need it. And that encouragement is a benefit of God that God has given to us as members of the body of Jesus Christ. Because I say this, because sometimes people say, kind of the, the idea, what's in it for me when I become a Christian? Well, can we lay it out for them? Well, first of all, you're no longer in your sins. Okay, and? And? Well, let's see, you've got fellowship with one another. You're not inside in the world, not in the world anymore. You can be free of that. And, well, we're at encouragement now, right? Because everybody needs it. Everybody needs encouragement. All of us do. And it comes in various ways and various forms through various people. And sometimes it can be in the oddest ways. And you can leave of being with some of your brothers and sisters for whatever, maybe a Saturday morning breakfast or maybe a Sunday morning worship or maybe something else and think, you know what? I feel a whole lot better now than when I came. And folks, that's the benefit plan that God has made for us. That's the way He wants it to be. That when we come together, we can provoke, we can stir, we can encourage one another. That reciprocal action there. Help me and I'll help you. And it should never be a burden to do that. Oh, pfft. I gotta go help somebody today. <laughs> gotta help somebody get through life today. What a what a chore, what a burden. I'm afraid not, folks. The folks there the, in the letter of the Hebrews, they were seeing a lot of suffering, a lot of persecution, a lot of heartache. But he said, "You want to get help in this? One way you can see each other a little bit more, and not talk about those things." I've seen people in Bible classes want to talk about everything going on in the world. You know, haven't you had enough of the news all week? Can't we get out of the news channels and the newspapers and the headlines for one day? You know why people are mad half the time? Because they read the news all the time. <laughs> read all these news sources all day long. Watch every TV program and they're stomping mad and kicking around and come in. And no matter what you're talking about in the Bible class, it goes back over to something over here. Mad. Can we get back to John 3.16? <laughs> I don't know how we got off on this, but let's go back to John 3, 16 and talk about something that's a lot better, right? Yeah. Now, we understand about things of the world and how that affects us, but nevertheless, that's what these folks wanted to do. Paul there in Philippians, he, he implores two ladies, Yodia and Syntyche. These ladies, one, the main reason he implores these ladies, he's congratulatory, he's thankful for these ladies, is that they were his fellow laborers in the gospel. It's not talking about them standing up and preaching or standing on a street corner and preaching or whatever those things are, but they helped him. We can be fellow laborers in this. We can be encouragers to someone else, even if we're not, quote, in the limelight, right? And I can assure you, if you would ask Paul right now, if he could speak to us about the limelight of preaching in his day, uh, he wouldn't say it's all glory and glamour. He'd say, let me lift up my shirt and show you what it's like preaching in the first century to people that hate it. And I can show you the lashes on my back, the scars on my body, the inability probably by that time to even close his hands and open his hands. He'd been beaten so many times and wrecked and all the things he'd gone through. But he said, these ladies in particular. I love about Paul, he always mentions people by name. They helped me. They were fellow laborers or co-laborers with me in the gospel. They did things that assisted me in whatever way it may have been. We have no idea. But they did something rather than nothing. And that was an encouragement to Paul. When you read through the New Testament, you see Paul and his adventures a lot right especially in acts you can help especially when you get to the letters romans ephesians and philippians all these other letters constantly read the last chapter of romans read romans 16. you'll count over 30 names that he mentions in particular of people who helped who encouraged who spoke a good word who did whatever else it was he mentions these people. You know what he also does when you get to First and Second Timothy? He mentions people that hindered him too. Way to go, Paul. <laughs> we need to know who those folks are. But the people who encouraged him, he wants them to know, thank you. 
I've said for years, and I've preached uh, a few dozen funerals or more by this time, been a lot of situations, seen that, and I've always made it a point to, in my life, to tell people what I think about them, good ways, what I think about them. What I think about them while I'm living, because after the dead, I've told you before, they can't hear it. And that's exactly the lesson I think that Paul gives us throughout the epistles. The encouragement to someone else. We don't do these things just for praise. We don't do it just for the limelight or glory or anything else. But it sure is nice to know that you're appreciated, isn't it? Once in a while that you, you're appreciated and people enjoy it. We're going to do it regardless, right? But it's sure good to hear it. Paul was good about that. These ladies, these people over here, this fellow over here, all help me in my way of the gospel. There's encouragement there that we get from that. We get growth, folks. We grow quite a bit because we always eat, right? That's part of our growth. We grow that way. But I think more so we grow in our fellowship and encouragement and all those things. But we get this growth from coming together and learning, studying, and comparing our minds with one another, with our study of the Bible, with our understanding of it, with our knowledge of the Scriptures. All these things are there. When Paul wrote to Titus here, another young preacher, much like Timothy, <clears throat> excited it sounds like to me when you read through this passage, he was excited about the grace of God that's appeared to all people. It's here. It's available. It's all over the place. But listen to what he says when he begins verse 12, teaching us. Now let's stop for just a moment. People talk about grace all the time. Oh, I'm saved by grace, and by grace of God I've done this, and so does the New Testament, by the way. The grace does a lot of things, but I think sometimes we overlook the fact that grace teaches. That grace is the greatest teacher in the New Testament. Grace here may stand for the gospel, may stand for Jesus, may stand for others. I have no idea. But grace teaches us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That we should put those things out of our mind. That we should live that way acceptable to God and to Jesus Christ. And we do these things. It teaches us that we deny those things to live that holy, acceptable life in Jesus Christ. But grace does that to us. Grace is not something that is mystical like smoke and floats around and we just hope it's going to fall on us. It's fallen on us if we've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now what are we going to do with it? Talk about it? Put it on the shelf? I used to give out baptismal certificates. You remember those? When I was baptized, the guy asked me if I wanted one. I said, do I need it to go to heaven? <laughs> He said, no. I said, okay, don't waste the paper. I'm okay, pal. <laughs> I'll remember, and God knows that's all that matters to me. But we don't need that certificate because we know we've got grace. It's appeared. It's teaching us, and we're growing. We had read for us 1 Corinthians 3 a moment ago <clears throat> about the church in Corinth, and I think they needed all these things we're looking at today and more. And they certainly needed the attitude of growth in that congregation of maturation, of looking beyond. We know when we go through this epistle that they had no excuses, and especially here. He says, I'd like to write, to write to you and talk to you like you're spiritual people, but he says, I can't. The only way I can talk to you is like carnal. Now you look at the, the, the indication of all the things that he's given here. I want to talk to you like spiritual people, which implies very clearly that they're not. Because if, if they didn't understand that, he says, wait just a moment, i talk to you like carnal. Carnal has the idea of worldliness, of uh, outside of God, God's favor, uh, on the dark and light is the, is the contrast that's given here. So that's the way I have to talk to you like you're worldly people, like babes in Christ. He said, I fed you with milk so I could give you strong meat, good food, mature food. He says, but now I can't even do that. I've got to go back and give you milk again. Shameful is the picture that Paul paints. Folks, we, God's benefit plan allows us to grow. It allows us to change our spiritual and even our, our physical life and the way we live around anybody else, which spiritual is always on. It's on 24-7, right? It changes how we do those things. And through the growth and through the understanding of the grace of God, and the fact of how we live our lives, and the fact that we look at the situation here going on in Corinth, and we don't let ourselves be stuck on the bottle, so to speak, 
of that spiritual milk. Nothing wrong with milk. You've got to have it to start growing, right? But once you start growing, you want to get into something else. And that was the chastisement here. He said, I'm talking to you like your worldly people, carnal people. Like you've never seen Jesus, you've never experienced the God of grace, like you've never experienced salvation or anything else. Yet I've got to talk to you like that. And that's simply without excuse. The milk needs to go away. And folks, listen, this great benefit that we have here is just that. It's growing, it's learning, it's nurturing, and seeing and moving on. We don't want to stay spiritual babies. Spiritual babies are the ones that get themselves in trouble with God because they never see, they never reach for the better food, they never put the bottle down and don't want those things. Folks, let's not let's miss out on the growth that God has given us. And finally, think about this. With this knowledge, goes back to our growth just a little bit here, but in the gaining of that knowledge, I think it builds on all these other things that we've seen, or you might say all three of these others start leading to this one that I can look and I can understand more about me and more about what's going on because I can look to the Word of God. And he's got Hebrews 4.12 uh, on that picture there. But I can have that knowledge. And here's something that I know when we talk about, it comes up occasionally. What's the greatest ill in the church? What's the greatest harm going on in the church? What's the greatest thing the church is lacking? All these things come up all the time and people have all the different answers and they're probably all right. But, when you go through the Bible from front to back, one thing that has destroyed God's people since literally the very beginning is not knowing or not doing what they know. Hosea talks to uh, the northern kingdom of Israel in, in his book, and a lot of chastisement in this book as well. But one thing when you get to this book, matter of fact, if you go back to verse 1 of chapter 4, God had a controversy with the people of the land because it wasn't truth, mercy, or knowledge of God in the land. That's why they were falling. When you get to chapter 4, verse 6, it's on the screen for us this morning. When you get to verse 6, he says quite clearly, my people are destroyed. Why? For lack of knowledge. They simply didn't know. And notice something that you'll see all the way through the Bible, Old and New Testament, that ignorance is not an excuse and it's certainly never bliss. That God expects his people to know more. But folks, listen, this is a benefit that God has given us. That I can see and that I can know, that I can understand about my creator. That I can know about the grace we talked about a moment ago. That I can look at all of his holiness. That I can look at his great love and all the things that he's given to me. Without knowledge of God, I'm doing nothing but quoting platitudes. Or Hallmark cards. And I don't know which is worse sometimes. Why not quote God? Why not look at what God says about himself? There are 66 books in what we call the Bible. And they exalt God in every one. Every one. We're studying Judges on Sunday morning. Yet God is still exalted. Mankind has fallen to the depths of depravity. But God is still on His throne. God is still in power. God is still giving life. God is still granting them mercy and they don't even appreciate it. But I gain that knowledge, folks, and it makes everything else about my spiritual life grow. I see more of God. I see more of His favor. I see of right and wrong, good and bad. But amongst it all, God always comes out shining because you can't dull the image of God even among wicked, wicked people. That knowledge has to be there. And when Acts 17 11, you have uh, the preaching there going on and, uh, by Paul and talking to folks of a Jewish nature. And he asks them to check him by the Scriptures, quite literally. And I like that. I think that's great. Don't take my word. Take what the Bible says. But he says, these folks were more noble than those in Thessalonica, these Bereans. You know why? Because they diligently, quite literally, diligently searched the Scriptures Daily, every day, to see whether those things that he said were so. Now there's a knowledge that's going on there. Notice what he never did. I'll put that Bible down. You don't need that. Just listen to me. <laughs> he says, no, read it. And you know what they found when they read it? That everything he said about Jesus as the Christ of God was true. That he is the Messiah. That he did leave heaven for my sake. 
that he did die on the cross, the death of one who was a sinner but never sent a day in his life. And he did it all for me. And they see those things. Folks, see what knowledge does for us? It gains us. It gives us a great benefit of God. But I think this all leads to what I want to look at here as we close. Where do we belong? He said that while he was living. He said that to living people. He's still saying it to living people. We may be here. He says our citizenship, where our true membership is, is in heaven above, not down here. And I, you look at the benefits, just the few we've looked at today, and all of them, all of them, all of them, always point our souls, our minds, and our bodies and spirits to heaven. There's never a deviation from that anywhere in the Bible. There's never a deviation to look in another direction to think about how great Paul is or Peter is or anyone else. Matter of fact, when I read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it's quite the opposite. I'm glad I didn't baptize in my name, he says. You start calling yourself by my name. But it all goes back to Jesus. That's the picture that the Bible gives us. That's our benefits plan, folks. You're not going to beat it anywhere. You know, no matter where you go to work, no matter what you have to do in this life, it's not going to be better than what we have here. It can't be. Because we have something that's going to encourage us. Those extra benefits I may get on my job in life are not going to make me as happy as what God does. And if they do, folks, I need to back up and read the Bible one more time at least, if not for the first time, and understand about where true happiness rests. I would recommend a few passages, Matthew chapter 6, and 19, and following, and others. Don't lay up, store, store up treasures on earth, where moth and rust does come in and corrupt it, but he says, lay up treasure in heaven. Amen. Thieves can't come in, moths can't chew it up, and nothing's going to rust up. Now, folks, that's what our benefit plan is going to do. It gets us to heaven. It gets us across that threshold and into eternity with God Almighty and all the saved from all the ages. That's what God has left for us. One of the many things God has left for us. If you're here today and you're not a child of God, we want to ask of you to do so. To submit your will to God's will. To let Him take over your life. Let Him do the things because He knows far better than we do. To let someone immerse you in water for the mission of sins because God said that's what we do. God said it, not me. And we do those things because we love God. Because we want to follow the will of God. And because we really want this benefit package. Because I've just touched the hem of the garment today. It gets better and better and better. Maybe you are a Christian but you've fallen away and you don't, think, you don't see the benefits like you used to. Folks, we encourage you too. Come forward if you have need while we stand and while we sing.